because this labor movement, okay, just like the movement in the physics, water move, you know, or, or other energy move. Uh, so the Chinese, most of the early Chinese, I think, as you know, I'm not going to go too detail here, mostly came from Guangdong province, or Southeast Asia, the Chinese, overseas Chinese in Southeast Asia, mostly came from Fujian province. Uh, in this map, it should be this area, but it's not marked. And people from Guangdong, why Guangdong? And if you look at the history, because I'm a historian, I always like to, whatever I talk, I always trace the history. I bore people all the time, but sometimes I have a lot of wonderful stories to tell. <laughs> so the Guangdong was a, a hub of overseas migration. But actually, the Guangdongese, they were the early migrants, okay. as early as the Han Dynasty. Sorry, as the Qing Dynasty. So actually, the uh, Guangdongese or Guangdongren, they initially, <coughs> originally, they're from the North time. But during the Qing Shi Huang, the Qing Dynasty, that's around 200 BC, the government dispatched the more than 100,000 Chinese, the Han Chinese, mainstream Chinese, to South. So that is the first group of the, the Guang, Guangdongren. And later on, you know, they, they uh, uh, expanded according to their dialect, the Chaodouhua, Guangdonghua, you know, into three, and the Hakka, Hakka, Kejiafa, into three groups. But what is relevant to us, to Chinese Americans, is this specific geographical area. It's very localized, very concentrated, so-called the San Yi, Si Yi. Okay? In this map, San Yi, it means uh, three counties. Yi, this ancient structure, Chinese structure. Yi means a county. Okay. Three counties. Si Yi means four counties, and here uh, San Yi means three counties. So these are seven counties together with Canton. So roughly, these eight places. That's where most Chinese immigrants in the United States came from. And among them, more of them came from Taishan. So a lot of the local will know that. Only one can, one, one can speak Thai Chinese. One is Chinese. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you can't speak Thai Chinese, you're not Chinese. Because the Chinese, before 1940s, was known as Taiwanese. You're not Thai Chinese. The Thai Chinese was Putonghua, was standard language, Chinese language, among overseas Chinese. Why? It's because it was very numerous. Most Chinese in the US came from Thai Shan. That is the case in Chicago. Most of the early clans, for example, Susan's uh, ancestor, Moy, or, or Margie's uh, ancestor, uh, they are from the Moy clan. And the same time, Yuan, okay? Yuan was also the big name. I went to their village, home village, in Duanfen town. Uh, in that uh, village, uh, the majority of the people are either from the Moy or from the Yuan family. Uh, and Wang, Qing, Lin, okay, those are the early major clans. But among them, Moi's was the largest. I physically counted the immigration records uh, in international, uh, the, uh, immigration and the naturalization service, uh, which is uh, uh, held in the Great Lake branch of National Archives. Uh, it has uh, these special collections called uh, Chinese Chicago Chinese case file. So abbreviation I use in my book is CCCF. So I look at the file um, because there's a lacking of a, a good uh, cataloging or indexing. Uh, so I have to physically I look at this uh, uh, list and I did a tally. Uh, there are more than 6,000 cases and among them uh, more than more than thousand names or surnames of those individual cases uh, are Moise. Okay, so the Moise was the largest clan, and but the other clans also uh, as as populous as well. But here, uh, since the Moise brothers were most prominent, okay, the more publicity. So we're going to use Moise as example to analyze the early Chinese community. Uh, they from Taishan and then other counties, uh, Taiping, Enping, Qinghui. So those are the so-called four counties. Then the three counties are Nanghai, Panyu, Shundu. So the way most people from those people area came, one is because 
the uh, 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 proximity to Guangdong. Guangdong historically had been a harbor. International trade had a long history there, as early as Tang Dynasty, but most famously during the Song Dynasty. Guangzhou, Quanzhou, Zhangzhou, Fuzhou. So those are the ports where the foreigners trade, mainly Arabs. Okay. Arabs trade with Chinese. So this long time history made the Cantonese specialize. Their specialty is immigrants. They produce immigrants. So this, uh, while meanwhile, the Fujianese went to Southeast Asia. So the Cantonese, why they came <coughs> in mid 19th century, it has something to do with the peculiar international situation at that time. Okay. So that was also the age of uh, imperialist expansion. Okay. America was one of the fast growing countries among a number of industrialized countries. So China, or Orient, is a place many people are hungry for. Okay. Americans hungry for China's China, the porcelain. It's tea, right? It's rugged. So a lot of the American rich, uh, for, for example, the Bostonians, you know, the people in Boston, this rich family, of, for example, Peabody, you know, um, uh, their status is symbol, symbol of status is to have some Chinese uh, artifacts. Chinese China. Okay, so those early settlers. So the oriental goods is really in high demand, really desired. And that's part of the reason the Westerners <coughs> went to China to trade with Chinese. But the Chinese, on the other hand, didn't want to trade. Okay? The Chinese emperor <coughs> Tianzi said, we possess, a, we have a great land, we have everything, so we don't need to trade with you. So if you come here, you are admitting that you are in Europe, right? That's why I welcome that, you know, if you want to trade, you know, if you want to present your tribute. So this uh, uh, merchandise were regarded as uh, tributes or presents presented to Chinese emperor. Okay. So the Chinese didn't have the concept of trading, so the Chinese refused to trade, and the Chinese actually closed all other ports except the Canton. So this international trade was called the Canton Trade. And this trade was limited because the Chinese government won't want this trade to go out of hand. So they have these special merchants, so-called the Hong merchants, to control the trade. So that made the foreigners very angry, foreign traders. Then we found something Chinese couldn't resist, which I guess you all know is what? Opium. Opium, yeah. So Chinese couldn't resist opium. Okay? Chinese didn't buy the fabric. Chinese didn't buy other merchandise, you know, manufactured goods. But once the opium was smuggled to China, then gradually more and more, 100,000, 500,000 chests a year. And the Chinese just wouldn't stop. The government tried to ban, but you know, you know, once you get addicted, what will happen next, right? So this opium became a havoc for China, but got the same for the Western traders. So they want to trade unlimited and freely. That becomes the Opium War. So this conflict resulted in the Opium War, and of course you see the Chinese who were still used bow and arrow fighting the people who came on the gunboat with cannon. <coughs> you can imagine what is the result of war. China lost. So Chinese was forced to sign the treaty, so-called Treaty of Nanjing. First provision is open ports, open five ports. Not only Canton, but also Xiamen, Fuzhou, Ningbo, Shanghai. So because of that, you know, this open port, you know, Cantonese lost their original monopoly of international trade. And the many people's livelihood was associated with this trade. Then they have to find another way. So going overseas become a viable choice. Okay, that's why all the people in those countries came. They are close to Canton. They can come to Canton and from Canton uh, to Hong Kong. The typical route is from Hong Kong to San Francisco. Okay, that took uh, two months. Usually the cost is a, a, a train, I'm sorry, not train. Steamboat ticket is $50. Okay, it's not much today, but it was a large sum. 
So the many Chinese came as indentured laborers or coolies. And this, those are the uh, bowls, you know, the scene, scenery in the, in the typical uh, boar time. So the Chinese came here, you know, here I um, borrow this, uh, <coughs> this, this uh, uh, paradigm, okay, this pairing terms from immigration history. So the immigration historians borrow this term, this pair of terms from physicists. Because my husband is a physicist, so I am familiar with some physics terms. The push and the pull, right? This is a this is the force to interpret the natural forces of any movement in the universe. But here the scholars use the push and the pull to describe the various elements uh, either pushed or attract the immigrants to the US. Pushing force is the elements or forces from the sending country. Okay. Uh, uh, I think I, I was, uh, yeah, okay. for example, war disasters in China, right? Opium war, natural disasters in 1840s, a lot of famines, droughts, floods, uh, and social turmoils, uprising, typhoon rebellions, near rebellions. So that forced the Chinese to find another way to make their life. And then the pulling force, pulling force indicating attractions and anime, uh, elements in the receiving country. US was not the only receiving country. Okay? Other receiving countries of immigrants <coughs> included Australia, Canada, South Africa. And for the similar reasons, discover of gold, right? Gold was discovered in California. Likewise, also in uh, Australia, uh, also in South Africa. So Chinese also uh, joined this ar army of gold miners. But when Chinese came, uh, they were already left behind because the white miners already worked out those uh, surface gold mines. So Chinese usually take up this one left out by the white miners. They work hard. So most common methods they used as gold miners is the so-called place plating. Uh, you know, there are different ways. Hydraulic, right? They use the high water pressure to wash them down. Uh, but the cheapest and the easiest is the so-called uh, plate, uh, uh, plating. Okay? You take a plate, right? You pan it, or called pan here, right? Pan here, yeah, pan it. You just, uh, yeah, and you shake, then the gold has a heavier metal. Well, uh, leave in the bottom, right? This is gold deposit you can collect that. Okay, that's your gold, uh, gold nuggets, okay? Uh, so the Chinese work in the gold mine. Uh, I have a lot of window stories about because of the limit of time, I'm not going to get to that. Okay, there are some stories about how the Chinese made gold. You know, there's a very, very intriguing story there. Maybe next time, if you invite me again. <laughs> <laughs> and the Chinese also worked in the railroad, right? Yeah, railroads, yeah. Uh, especially the, the, the western part of the transcontinental railroads, mainly were built by Chinese. Eastern part were built by other white uh, immigrant laborers, Irish and Chinese. But on the western part, because of the low pay, they were paid $30 a month, $40 a month, and also because of the danger involved in work. They had to blow this mountain, right? Rocky Mountain. Dynamite was just invented that time. So it was not safe. Oftentimes, the workers didn't know when it would explode, right? You sat in there, and they have Then you go attack. <laughs> Ooh, it blow around. And many people, their eyes blow, or head blow out. So the accident was a common uh, uh, <coughs> place. So because of that, many uh, workers quit. <laughs> then the <coughs> railroad um, contractors, so-called Big Four, okay, one of them is a Kurt, is uh, Leland Stanford, right, the founder of Stanford University. And uh, Stanford and his uh, partners decided to have experiment to hire some Chinese, uh, for which people are full of suspicion. So the Chinese are so tiny, right? The Chinese customers, physically they're smaller. A uh, typical size is just like a little bit taller than me, my height. 